NerdR Virtual Workshop, Wednesday Sessions, October 19, 2022, 1527 UTC. Recorded by and organized by Samantha Foster. Speaker, Joe Hink. Uh, that can look into the future and see how different technologies might be useful to their cases. So uh, with sort of that as a backdrop, I really wanted to think about what what you may not have heard about and uh, or at least I'm not seeing being used in various cases. Uh, and so I thought these might enhance some of the work that you're doing. And the first is an introduction to sonar technology. Um, and that will be by Aaron Delone. And then shifting a lot of Aaron's work is on inland rivers. Uh, but then we're going to shift over to coast and look at living pilings, examples for restoration from Samantha Richman. We know that there's a plethora of data out there in terms of remote sensing, and uh, there's a lot of commercial imagery that's available for free. Uh, and who doesn't like free? So uh, Stephen Hack is going to give us a, a background on that for uh, federal entities and, and others on, on how um, we can access this that may be useful for establishing baseline um, or looking at uh, restoration trajectories. And then we're going to end up uh, the session with alternative uh, animal testing alternatives. Now this is kind of out there, but we like to be proactive in thinking about where the NERDA program may be heading uh, in the future or where it may have to head uh, given certain uh, rules that may come down in, in terms of toxicity testing with live animals. Patricia Bright, Jessica Leet, Barnett Ratner. So um, each talk will be about 20 minutes. Uh, which should include Q&A. If we run out of time, then I've asked the presenters to post their questions in or uh, answer questions in the chat. Upcoming webinar, November 9, 2022, 2 p.m. Eastern. Restoring Fire Adapted Ecosystems with Prescribed Fire. Kevin Hears. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and invite Aaron Galone to share his slide. And while He's doing that. I'm going to give just a short introduction for Aaron. OK, I see you, Aaron. Wonderful. And uh, it's your choice uh, if you want to stay on camera and go off. Um, I'm going to go off to preserve bandwidth. Um, but Aaron is an ecologist with USGS from the Columbia Environmental Research Center in Columbia, Missouri. His research has focused on Relationships between environmental variables and reproduction of sturgeon, the development and use of telemetry systems for large rivers, the application of biologically deployed remote sensing tags for the analysis of fish behavior and habitat use, and underwater acoustic and sonar systems to monitor large river fishes and place movement and behavior within larger context for the surrounding physical environment. So Aaron, thank you so much. And I can see your slides and I'm gonna go on mute. USGS logo, Columbia Environmental Research Center, River Studies Branch, speaker, Aaron Delany. Great, so I'm gonna go um, take my picture down so you can't see all the funny faces I make when I talk. Um, and also to preserve some bandwidth, I've got some animations that are embedded, so hopefully they'll work. They might be a little bit gitchy because uh, you know, Teams doesn't handle bandwidth real well. So um, turn my camera off here and um, I'm going to uh, briefly describe uh, the uh, recent advances in sonar technology that have become available in recent years. I'm not going to go through exhaustively all of the sonars that are available or throw a bunch of jargon at you. I'm going to show a bunch of imagery that is the result of uh, sonar surveys, but keep in mind that with every sonar survey uh, and every image, there's a tremendous amount of data behind it. So even maps are not just maps, but there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of data behind it. Just acknowledge some folks who helped along with this presentation. Carrie Elliott is our expert on uh, physical habitat and uh, the application of sonars to map and characterize physical habitat. And you'll see some of her fabulous products later on. And also Chad Vichy, 
who um, is uh, helps with a lot with our imaging sonar uh, technology. Uh, so for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with sonar, um, maybe you don't know what to think about when you hear sonar. Sonar is just a technique that uses sound propagation uh, to navigate, measure distances, communicate with or detect uh, objects. It is an acronym for sound navigation and ranging. Um, maybe when you hear sonar, you think of uh, biological types of sonar like um, a bat or dolphin echolocation, or maybe you think about all those movies that you watch with submarines and ships in World War II and, and uh, hunting submarines, or maybe you think about fish finders that you typically find um, on recreational fishing boats. All of those are, are different types of sonar and used sound um, underwater. Three photos, a large boat, two dolphins jumping, and a black bat. Um, in recent years, there's been some tremendously rapid development uh, technologically in sonars, and there's been a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of those reasons is commercial fish exploitation um, in the open ocean and ocean fisheries, and concomitantly, uh, the related uh, population monitoring that goes along with management agencies that are trying to manage those diminishing uh, stocks. Uh, there's also been a lot of work uh, push in uh, aquatic habitat surveys and assessments, especially with concepts like essential and critical fish habitat, and also a lot of interest in using sonar to look at habitat forming processes and geomorphological dynamics. Um, there's been a tremendous push in technology resulting from coastal and ocean resource exploitation that includes petroleum and mineral exploitation uh, and the submerged infrastructure that goes along with that. And I think some of you are probably aware uh, that a lot of this technology was developed uh, in association with the uh, incident assessment remediation, especially with things like uh, deep water um, horizon spill uh, and others. Um, there's also been some uh, Department of Defense initiatives trying to uh, develop technologies that can locate underwater exploded unexploded ordnance underwater, things like landmines, um, helping to clean up uh, Department of Defense sites that may have um, different uh, things that have been uh, disposed of in, in uh, less than careful ways. Um, Homeland Security has also been a big contributor, especially on the high end of high frequency, high resolution sonars, especially looking for um, incidents of harbor intrusion or vessel inspections at ports. Um, all of those are, are um, have combined to, to create this explosion in technology. Um, and, even, and while all of this is being uh, developed uh, for commercial and scientific application, there's also a big push to develop this for recreational grade type sonars that fishermen carry. Also a big um, contributing factor is the um, contribution of the wide availability uh, and inexpensive uh, uh, systems for real-time kinematic and differential GPS. That uh, ability to position uh, and collect geospatially referenced data has been huge. Um, so in the past, when we talked about sonar and sonar surveys, we talked about ships, big ships with large computers and large processors. Now um, the platforms for most sonar systems uh, can be very small. So there's been an explosion of sonar technology and application of sonar technology in inland waters uh, and shallow water habitats. Now it includes survey watercraft, even personal watercraft, vessels of opportunity where it's some other boat and you just uh, bolt the equipment on and away you go. Uh, AUVs both on the surface and underwater. Uh, there's even sonars that are uh, handheld uh, diver sonars. Um, and some of the sonars that we use are also autonomous and can be stationarily deployed. Seven photos of different boats and water platforms. Uh, the first tech we'll talk about is probably what most people are familiar with. Those are single beam sonars. Uh, those are typically the sonars that most people would have on their fishing boat. Um, it's a single beam with a single transducer. You can put them on all sorts of boats from small to large. A single beam uh, comes from a transducer, and all a transducer is is um, the part of the sounder that converts an electronic signal to a sound signal, sends it out, 
uh, and then collects the information of the, the, the signal as it comes bouncing back um, to the sounder. So that's what that hockey puck looking thing is. Those are the transducers. Uh, they provide pretty detailed coverage wherever the boat is driven. So single beam surveys are typically done on transects. And then the data is interpolated to provide continuous bathymetric coverage. Um, single beam surveying is, is relatively inexpensive and most people can do it um, without a lot of uh, a training. It just takes a sounder, a transducer, um, a differential GPS and, and uh, some sort of minimal vessel that's appropriate for the habitat that you're working in. Now I want you to look, take a look at these and, and just go ahead and memorize them. Uh, this is an example of a single beam survey of pallid sturgeon spawning habitat. You can see the transects on the left, and then you can see the interpolation of the right on the right of the depths and uh, the little circles of uh, dots on the map are positions of pallid sturgeon during the spawning event. So single beam sonar is really good for constructing bathymetric maps, uh, doing habitat classifications by depth, looking at volumes, both volumes of water and volumes of sediment, and changes in bed form or sediment profiles um, over time. Um, there's another type, the next type of, of single beam sonar is more applicable to fisheries or um, aquatic life uh, studies of organisms that are in the water column. It works both for large fish, small fish, and it's even used all the way down to zooplankton. So typically split beam sonar is a sonar that has a different configuration of the transducer. It allows you, because it's in quadrants, uh, the geometry of the transducers and quadrants, it allows you to determine from the return of the sonar where in the sonar beam the organism is and how big it is. Um, this also can be, this so type of sonar can also be deployed on uh, boats, both large and small, uh, both mobile and stationary monitoring platforms. Uh, this type of sonar is typically used for fish abundance and biomass estimates because we can tell how big the fish is and where it is in the beam. We can calculate a target strength and then we can do both echolocation and echo integration, which means we can count them and then we can determine the biomass of the organisms um, in the water. It's a more expensive system. These systems will probably run in the $40,000 range as compared to the, the previous single beam for bathymetry, which will be in the $20,000 range. Um, it does require some moderate levels of training, and these are really good for looking at population abundance, population distribution. If you turn them on your side and you look across the river, they're often used for counting fish as they pass up river. So you can look at things like uh, migration returns um, and, and responses to any type of stimuli in the environment or uh, any kind of alteration. Diagram of the different beams, single dual and split beam. On the right is an output of the split beam sonar showing fish and the bottom. Um, the next type of sonar that uh, we typically use a lot is a side scan sonar. It's not a whole lot different from a single beam sonar. It has two transducers, one on each side. Both um, go uh, out and send signal out uh, laterally. It hits the bottom, runs along the bottom and comes back. Uh, they're both research grade and survey grade units. Uh, these are really popular now on a lot of uh, fishing boats. If you have $1,000 or so to put one on your fishing boat, um, they are great because they show continuous um, imagery of the bed form and a lot of the, the features that are underwater. Um, there's a wide range of frequencies uh, and they're really, really great. We use them for looking at habitat types. Drawing of a boat with a side scan sonar attached and the scanning space outlined on the bottom of the ground. Another drawing of the sonar with labels for tow cable, towfish, direction of survey vessel, starboard transducer beam, port transducer beam, arrow going from each end with label swath and a smaller arrow area on the right with label sonar range. An image of a scan with labels that include sonar signal source, water column, first bottom, direction of towfish, acoustic shadows, and sonar returns, bottom topography, 
objects or targets, and suspended clutter. Arrows on the bottom stretch the entire image with label sonar record. From the middle to the far right side has labeled 20 meters. We look at uh, large um, bed forms or, or dunes, um, bedrock uh, in the center, uh, fish distribution inside of dunes, and we can also tell when a fisherman has uh, forgot to set their parking brake and put their boat in the water. Four different imagery from a side scan sonar. Multi-beam sonar is probably the area where most of the uh, advances have come. Multi-beam sonars are actually an array of transducers uh, that can provide a very detailed full bottom coverage of the bottom of the river. Uh, the modern multi-beam systems are compact now. Uh, they can survey about four to, five, four to seven times the water depth in a swath. So when you drive and do a survey, it's like mowing the lawn. Uh, you can map fine scale features and you can monitor geomorphic processes and the products are outstandingly amazing. They are complex systems and they're comp coupled with a, an inertial navigation system, uh, sound velocity probes, uh, uh, very precise GPS systems and um, uh, sensors that determine pitch, roll and heave. Image of a boat scanning under the water with labels 512 equally spaced death readings recorded per ping. Single sound wave formed into beams. Last label is swath width approximately four times water depth. There are five different photos of tools. And so this is what um, a detailed uh, um, multi-beam image looks like. So remember, I, I told you to memorize that um, bathymetric survey before the pellet sturgeon spawning area. This is the same area, but done in multi-beam. And what you can see is very complex, um, very uh, detailed bed forms of the spawning habitat. Image of the multi-beam sonar data with details of explanation of males, females, and distance. Um, if you look in the main stem lower Missouri River and you start to study what multi-beam imagery looks like, and remember there's data behind this, right? Every point on this image has depth uh, as well. Uh, and you can see where the water is, uh, where the deep areas are, how the structures affect the flow of sediment. Some of these uh, dunes are actually more than three meters in height. Two images of the multi-beam sonar output of data with color code for depth. So if you take a look at an animation of a, of a four hour um, sequence of imagery taken at one hour sequences, you can see that these uh, dunes actually move quite rapidly down the river. So multi-beam is a great tool for looking at mobilization of sediment, uh, whether it is uh, sand dunes or whether it's some type of contaminated sediment or mine tailings or something else uh, in the river that you're interested in, in uh, what's mobilized and what the mass transport is. Um, we also use multi-beam because it's a great tool to look at critical habitats. This is spawning habitat um, below uh, Gavin's Point Dam on the lower Missouri River combined with telemetry locations from a uh, acoustic telemetry array, array and uh, we can uh, determine the depths um, uh, where spawning is occurring along with the, the bottom types and uh, bottom composition where spawning patches are. Image of a multi-beam sonar with a close-up of a small area. Explanation includes pallid sturgeon location with colored dots for female, verified running, reproductive, and males. Uh, the last type of sonar that we use is the multi-beam imaging sonar. Uh, this is the really cool one. Uh, I'll just back up a little bit. Uh, a multi-beam system is going to cost you north of $100,000. Uh, these multi-beam imaging sonar systems will cost somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000. Uh, they are high frequency, operating in the megahertz type range. And there's different types. There's the Ditson, which is the older model. There's an Eris, and there's also other companies that make these. A Blue View is one. And what it does is it's a multi-beam uh, sonar, which uses an array of transducers to produce video-like imagery. Photo of an Eris multi-beam imaging sonar. Graphic of the Dit Isaman with labels that red forms 96.0.3 degree beam. 
29-degree field of view. Beams are 14-degree tall. 96 individual 0.3-degree beams. Two additional graphics of the did sun output view. And we're going to see if we can get it to run. OK, it's going to be a little bit kitschy for you, but this shows you what the um, type of resolution that you can get. Um, these are fat head minnows um, looking at um, schooling behavior of fat head minnows. A uh, little bit interesting thing about sonar. Uh, they're often called acoustic cameras, but. Um, when you're looking down from a, a dorsal perspective, this is what you get. So if you're familiar with a, like a video camera or a still camera, you have a portrait mode and a landscape mode. So this would be the landscape mode. And you can see these are pallet sturgeon and you're looking down on them. You can see their backs and their pectoral fins pointed out. But if you go ahead and you just turn the camera into the portrait mode, not moving it, just rotating the camera, um, you actually get a cool picture from the side. So uh, you get a different behavioral perspective and you can see that the fish, uh, even though it lives in the current, doesn't spend a lot of time oppressed to the bottom of the river. Um, we use um, the Eris uh, and the distance off uh, sonars a lot or looking at behavior. It can also be used to look at composition of fine substrates, and it can also be looked at the response of um, any kind of fish or aquatic organism to things like nets or effluent pipes or um, discharges or uh, releases from dams or anything like that. And it allows us to look at behavior in very fine detail. So what you're looking at here is the bottom of the Missouri River with upstream at the bottom, downstream at the top. You can see the bed load of the river, the sand moving over the top, and pallid sturgeon sitting on the spawning habitat with coarse substrate um, as the sand blows over the top of them and they hide pretty much behind the dunes. Um, now it's very common that we typically use uh, sonar technologies together, not just one technology, but multiple technologies. So this is a study that we did below a uh, hydroelectric facility looking at paddlefish distribution and behavior. The question was paddlefish show up when we release water, but are they spawning or what are they doing? So uh, we did acoustic transect surveys. We did split beam sonar to see what fish were there, how many were there. We did side scan sonar so we could see the extent of the habitat use in the tailwaters. And then we did some, did some imaging sonar to see what are those um... images from acoustic transect, split beam sonar, side skin sonar, and did sun imaging sonar? What are those paddlefish doing? So you can see that's what the paddlefish looks like. And we can actually see imagery of the paddlefish. You can see long snouts in the sonar uh, imagery, and you can actually uh, focus on the lower jaw uh, indicating the fish's mouth is open. And they're actually all lined up in the current feeding rather than swimming. Now, of course, sonar is just one technology and the power of these technologies for uh, whatever you want to monitor in the field is magnified uh, exponentially by the associated technologies that you can apply with it. So very often we use um, we, we use acoustic Doppler current profilers to collect velocity data, which is vector data of flows over the bed forms. We also use substrate and vegetation classification systems, uh, which is usually a software or hardware device that uh, connects with the sonar systems and interprets the sonar returns so that we can get information on the substrate and vegetation as well as um, depth and bed form type. LIDAR now is a new technology so that we can merge the symmetry velocity along with the elevation data of the surrounding habitat. Uh, which becomes really important for um, uh, hydraulic modeling uh, of the systems. Telemetry is widely used now, uh, both manual tracking telemetry and network arrays of passive uh, detection systems all over the landscape, um, 
from coast to coast and open ocean networks um, and taking telemetry data points and putting them in the context of the environment is really, really powerful. Um, at the same time, you're doing these uh, sonar surveys. You always can put out a sonde and drag it along and collect continuous water quality data, such as temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, whatever uh, your imagination um, can bring up. And I think uh, that's where I will stop. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Carrie, uh, and um, we can discuss um, your application. Speaker Joe Hank. Karen, thanks so much. A lot of great imagery there and lots of uh, technology for folks to think about. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next presenter, Sam Richmond, but I'd encourage folks, I think uh, Aaron and all the speakers are going to stay on for this session. So if you have a uh, question, please drop it in the chat for Aaron and, and he'll be monitoring that as well. Uh, all right, Sam, I see you. So as you're getting your slide up, I'm going to give just a, a really brief uh, bio for you. So. Uh, Samantha Richmond is a graduate of University of California, Santa Cruz and University of Wyoming and is now an ecologist at the San Francisco Bay Estuary Field Station at the USGS's Western Ecological Research Center. Sam's research focuses on the foraging ecology and energetics of sea ducks and does she love to talk about sea ducks? She makes me excited about them and I don't really know too much about them, uh, but she also uh, her research includes the enhancement of prey resources through habitat restoration and coastal ecosystems impacted by oil spill. So Sam, thanks so much, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, I don't think we can't hear you. I see in the chat we have some other sea duck fans, so that's great. <laughs> we are still not hearing you. We still aren't. Would you like um, me to go to the third speaker and then maybe come back? Would that work for you? OK, uh, we'll do that. So Stephen, uh, we're, we'll put you on on the spot here and we'll switch over to to your talk. And let's see. I see your slide. I'm going to give uh, Stephen hacks quick bio. He's been with USGS for over 10 years and previously worked for the Federal Geographic Data Committee in the Eastern Geographic Science Center. He currently works for the National Civil Applications Center and uses DOD resources to perform satellite tasking for federal civ civilian agency. Agency, excuse me. He has a bachelor's degree in geography from George Mason University and is currently pursuing a master's degree in geographic information systems at Penn State. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his wife and their new son, Austin. So, Stephen, thanks so much for being here. It looks like you're not quite in presenter mode yet on your slide deck. Speaker Stephen Hack. Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Speaker Joe Hank. I can hear you, yes. Okay. Perfect. See your All slides right. now. Speaker Stephen Hack. Perfect. So I'm presenting on commercial imagery um, from the US government uh, for NERDAR cases. Um, so Joe mentioned these are free commercial sources, but it was actually it's actually paid for. So but it's um, 
it's I guess it's free for us to use. <laughs> Logo for Civil Applications Committee, CAC. All right. So what we do, so um, I work for the CAC Source Management and we provide services for CAC principal members. And um, in the slides itself, I'll explain what the CAC is. Um, my colleague Dan Opstall will uh, give a quick brief on how the civil application works and who they are and what they do. So it, within my group, we process all classified imagery, commercial requests approved by the CAC, archive search and orders, submissions, tasking nominations for new data requests, and we do quali quality as assessment as well for data. So we also provide data archive and for dissemination of the data. Um, our USGS CAC management source team, so we're led by our DRO, our Department Re uh, Requirements Officer, Amy Bratton, Brenda Ellis, and Eros, data, uh, our data manager in uh, Sioux Falls, and um, Andrew and Jason and me. Andrew Hawk, Jason Defibaugh, Stephen Hack. So we're a team of five and we are subject matter experts in acquiring satellite data and also dissemination of data. So here are some of the sites that we are located. Um, we're located in the Devil Denver Federal Center, NGA, uh, National Geospatial Agency, uh, North Campus East, so that's in Fort Belvoir. Um, Eros uh, Data Center, that's where we disseminate all the data that we acquire for customers for commercial imagery. And I sit here at the USGS National Center in uh, Reston, Virginia. Photos of four buildings with labels EROS Science Center, South Dakota, NGA Campus East, Virginia, Denver Federal Center, Colorado, USGS National Center, Virginia. So this is the contract that what Joe was explaining that was uh, paid for by the federal government. So it's free for us to use for uh, Fed Civ members. So it's the EOCL. So I'm going to go, the EOCL stands for Electrical Commercial um, Overhead Layer. So, um, so basically it's replacing the Enhanced View follow-on contract that uh, that has uh, contract with Maxar. So Maxar is the Worldview 1, Worldview 2, Worldview 3, and GOI sensors, and also other sensors as well. So it's combining that with the Maxar uh, uh, company itself with Black Sky and Planet. So Black Sky and Planet are small set satellites. So this contract is about $4.7 million, and we'll have access um, for this over the next decade. So within 10 years, starting from this year. Um, so this this provides um, just uh, imagery access from three platforms. So, um, like I said, uh, if you look uh, down from uh, the vendors, uh, Maxar, Black Sky, and Planet. So, plat platforms are Worldview, Global, and SkySat. So, um, it provides Pan MSI, and the SWIR stands for Shortwave Infrared, and v VNIRS as well too. So. Um, those are what we can provide as a service for uh, for Fed Civ members. So this goes a little more detail about what the contract is. Uh, so the new contract grants uh, NRO access um, to the companies. NRO meaning that that's the National Reconnaissance Office that deals with these contracts that. Um, they negotiate the contracts for the Fed Civ community, so the Fed Civ community is us. Um, so you can see uh, in the future they're going to launch six new Legion satellites. That's uh, very. It's going to be very similar to the Worldview satellites. So they have Worldview one, two, and three. Currently, Worldview four is uh, not operational, but we're able to get the archival data and Planet um, data. Planet's another company that has the small sats that um, they have Planet Dove satellites. I think there's over about um, 200, 200 of them in uh, orbiting Earth. 32 of them are able, you're able to task using uh, the SkySat satellites. And we have Black Sky as well, that's um, taskable satellites as well that are small set. Images of May X Air, Black Sky, and Planet Sky sat one, two, and three. So the EOCL license, um, I wanted to display this of uh, showing that um, 
Nerda can um, Nerda customers are able to access this data as well. So see the caveat right here with um, US state and local and tribal governments. So you're able to get this data via working with a federal sponsor. So as long as the incident um, supports a federal or US federal mission, you're able to access this data. So it's fairly pretty flexible of who can use the data. This is another contract um, that um, I talked about electrical optical satellites. So the electrical optical satellites are the pan, panchromatic and MSI uh, satellites. This is a commercial radar um, company, MDA, that we're able to access radar sat too. So um, we're able to get up to 18 different B modes of taking full advantage of this satellite. Um, and radar is very good for if you have the factor with weather, um, obviously radar can penetrate through clouds and acquire that data for you. So spotlight is one of the one of the 18 B modes that can collect, and I believe it's a uh, resolution of up to three meters. So um, the only uh, downscale is if you're imaging with spotlight, it's a smaller scale of collection that you can collect from. So since you're uh, using more of a, um, you're wishing to get high resolution, so the target the target's going to be a lot smaller. And this contract is uh, based on the uh, Canadian fiscal year. So from April 1st to, to March 31st, we sort of are in a negotiation period, uh, NGA is. So um, usually we don't have collections going through that period since um, they have to come up with a new uh, contract every year. Graphic of the radar set satellite over items curved with colors and labels include V, subsatellite track. Extended beams, low incidence. Extended beams, high incidence. Scan has AR fine resolution beams, 50 kilometer swath. Wide swath beams, standard beams. Ultra fine wide beams, ultra fine narrow beams. All beam modes available in both right and left looking modes. So, how to obtain this commercial data set? So, um, you use the hyperlink uh, earthexplorer.com to register http colon forward slash forward slash earth explorer dot usgs dot gov forward slash register you, you receive a confirmation from brenda ellis that's our data manager from sioux falls south dakota and you're able to search uh for this data in earth explorer and if it's not an earth explorer you're, you're going to be putting the requirement in cider for a new collect to locate already acquired data, search Earth Explorer to determine if data already exists over your at OI access Earth Explorer and login http colon forward slash forward slash earth explorer dot usgs dot gov. Enter area of interest on search criteria tab. Select commercial data sets. Receive results and download data. If no results are returned, Access CIDR to place requirements. To request future acquisitions, CIDR HTTP colon forward slash forward slash CIDR dot CAR dot USGS dot gov. And this is what a CIDR requirement looks like. So it's pretty basic. You put your project up justification, data use and sharing, output formats of your parameters of what you're, you want to collect. So if you're collecting an EO, electrical, optical, panchromatic, or MSI uh, from those world, worldview sensors, uh, planet or black sky, or you're collecting that commercial radar for radar sat. And usually we'll work with the customer if uh, they're sort of new to this. Um, so don't be uh, afraid to putting a requirement in. Um, we're very active in this, so if we see something wrong, we'll we'll contact you and we'll work with you on what you're trying to trying to uh, capture. The CRSSP imagery derived requirement C IDR entry tool is designed to collect and provide query and report capabilities on near-term land, remote sensing data requirements of U.S. federal civil agencies. This priority effort is part of the CRSSP implementation and will assist agencies in leveraging resources in areas of common interest.
This is another site that's available for FedCiv members and also anybody that's um, working on supporting a US government mission. So this is Digital Globe and um, Global EGD. So genome delivery, uh, this is the genome delivery contract. So this is archival data um, and it takes the daily take um, of the Maxar sensors um, for, for use. So anybody can download an imagery quickly, exploit it within the web tool itself. So you're, you don't need a imagery software. You can just base it off of um, using this website to um, do your exploitation product and quickly um, bring it into a PowerPoint. So this is very useful, very quick. Uh, if you want to do that uh, quick analysis for shareholders and just want to show an imagery of your area of interest. Service providing the NGA and its customers with unclassified high resolution imagery in support of operational planning, emergency response and situational awareness. Global EGD's products are available in ready to use formats with access to more than 4 billion square kilometers of imagery in our archive. Global EGD also stays up to date by including the daily take, which adds about 1.5 million square kilometers, more than double the landmass of Texas, of new Earth imagery every day, ensuring that the most current data is quickly available. So side requests from various agencies. So this just this I just wanted to show this uh, pie graph of what agencies have uh, ordered uh, data through us. So these are through the CIDR requests from various agencies. So we get about 800 requirements uh, split that uh, from new collects and 400 of those requirements are archival collects. So you can just see the vast amount of agencies that are uh, using our resources to collect these high resolution uh, satellite data. So um, obviously we're hosting the the website CIDR, so majority of our customers are from USGS, but we have other DOI agencies as well, and you can see from other federal agencies uh, from this pie graph. Bureau of Land Management BLM 10%, Fish and Wildlife Service 7%, Forest Service 7%, Geological Survey USGS 43%, National Aeronautics and Space Administration NAAS a 7%, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOA, a 7%. National Park Service, 3%. National Science Foundation, NSF, 2%. Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, 5%. Other, 9%. So this is one of the examples I wanted to show. Um, just uh, so oil trig triggered by tsunami. Um, from Hunga Tonga volcano. This happened last year. That volcano was a, uh, it was equivalent to, I, I believe, a couple nuclear bombs, and it was able, it was able to um, have a tsunami wave enough to to hit Peru. So. Um, Graphic of a map with labels for Tonga, Hunga Tonga volcano, Peru, La Pampilla. Photo of Cavira Beach with oil. You can see this image right here. This is a radar image itself of um, using the radar set too that NOAA um, acquired. So you can see you see possible oil spills within that um, for this event. So uh, image with tidal marine pollution surveillance report that has arrows pointing to six different dark gray spots with the labels possible oil. And next slide. This ever moves. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is a recent um, event for Hurricane Ian, uh, Sanibel Island for Fort Myers Beach. So this was one of the examples where uh, customers are able to access the data, show that before and after. So you see this um, this area in Fort Myers, uh, just before and after shot, just uh, natural color. Two aerial satellite images of Sanibel Island. Image on left with label before Hurricane Ian and satellite image shows homes along Estera Boulevard in Fort Myers, Florida, August 17, 2022. Image on right shows missing buildings and damage with label after Hurricane Ian. 
A satellite image shows homes along Estero Boulevard in Fort Myers, Florida, September 30, 2022. So another uh, hurricane, um, I guess the flooding for Ian, um, you see in New Jersey, so that before and after shots. So you can obtain this data through that global EGD website that I was telling you about. Two aerial satellite images with tidal satellite photos show just how bad the flooding from Ida has been. Image on left with label, before flood July 14, 2020. Overview of homes along Huff Avenue and Rail Yard in Manville, New Jersey. Image on right shows large area covered in brown water with label during flood September 2, 2021. Overview of flooding homes along Huff Avenue and Rail Yard in Manville, New Jersey. Um, and here's another slide. Um, I wanted to show this. This is just a false color. Um, so th with the worldview sensors, you're able to get, um, you're able to manipulate the band combinations. So um, this is a natural color on the left and the right is uh, the false color. So these are some of the advantages you could take with those multiple bands. So with the worldview sensor, uh, worldview two sensors, it's up to eight bands. With worldview three, it's up to six, 16 bands. You can get the swear band, that shortwave infrared. So that's really good for penetrating through uh, thin clouds, especially for getting fires. Uh, we had a lot of fire events, so we tasked the shortwave infrared a lot for the U.S. Forest Service. And this is a flood uh, in Louisiana that we did in 2014. Um, and this is just an example of the multispectral. So this is very easy to produce. So it's the red, uh, green, and blue band combinations. And you can see the flood extent and the flood areas and the lake and river uh, streams. So um, very easy analysis you could do with an ArcGIS software and you could just pull it in. And um, yeah, and uh, this was part of the International Charter event, which uh, we provide coverage uh, for um, USGS tasks my group to provide that worldview imagery, but also other companies contribute data uh, for this event as well. Um, another example is mapping whales from space. Um, we're working with uh, NOAA, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, NGA, and the Civil Application, Application Committee. So these are examples that we could see um, using uh, satellite imagery. We can actually see uh, the fin whales. Um, so we Im we're imaging in Cook Inlet in Alaska, um, up in the Atlantic in um, the Cape Cod area, and NOAA and BOEM are creating these algorithms, working with Microsoft and um, Maxar to create, uh, I guess, using machine learning to uh, track these whales of once we capture satellite imagery. So we um, acquire a lot of satellite imagery for, for this group, and they're doing really neat work with it. So this is an ongoing project for about several years. Map of Alaska with close up of Cook Inlet. Map of Cap Cod. Two images of whales seen exhaling from space with label gray whales, left image, and a fin whale, right, are spotted by a satellite orbiting at an altitude of more than 600 kilometers. Credit 2018 Digital Globe, a Maxer company. Logos of partner agencies including NOAA, NGA, CAC, BOEM. And I just wanted to show this video. Um, Hopefully it'll pop up and I think you're seeing my screen right now. So this is um, a video of just using the Maxar worldview sensors and doing like a 3D animation. Very easy so to do within a imagery software, but this shows a convoy of when the, the Russians invaded um, Ukraine. So you could see uh, just the animation part of uh, how well these satellites, you can view the resolution. Um, and um, NERDA customers can take advantage of this um, using this type of uh, resource. And also these an animations are very easy to do. So just imagine that you want to survey restoration wetlands um, and an area that you can't get to. So you can't um, and the resources are very limited. So this is something where you can use space borne assets to capture what you want to look for for wetland restoration or any type of uh, emergency event for NERDA, so. I won't be playing it at all, so it's about a two minute video. OK.
Hyperlink is https colon forward slash forward slash s three dot amazon aws dot com forward slash content dot sat imaging corp dot com forward slash media two forward slash videos forward slash Russian dash Ukraine dash military dash convoy dash Kiev dot MP4. And the next slide, so I created this uh, flow chart very quickly. So um, of how a NERDA image request is, uh, will be accessed. So um, NERDA customers will determine whether the request is emergency or non-event. Uh, what, what advantage would this have for a US government mission? So you have to tie this to a US government mission, which your group already sort of has an interagency type of agreement with state and local and tribal. So that's a justification right there. And um, the customer will decide if it's a USGS CIDR requirement or HDDS. So HDDS stands for Hazard Data Distribution System. And they will decide if it's a emergency or a scientific request or if they just want to monitor the event itself so they would use cider so inform your fed sponsor so uh joe would be the uh, fed sponsor for usgs and um this can mature over time as well so since we find uh, we will find other fed sponsors that will kind of uh justify the requirements from a customer that's a non-fed um so that person will work with that customer to provide a justification after they will um they provide that uh Justification, the Fed sponsor itself will either enter it in CIDR or HDDS. Um, so I, this is an open invitation. Um, so the next step is uh, to work with Joe and I. We'll create the slick sheet for um, federal liaisons of, you know, what resources are available for imagery requirements. And I'll send some literature as well to Joe and she can pass it out to uh, anybody that's interested in acquiring this special data. Dan, I don't know if you're on now, but um, if you want to uh, talk about this slide for the civil application committee members. So the next slide, I believe I have the triple junction slide. I don't know if Dan Opsahl is on, but um, he was supposed to brief the slide, but I'll, I can quickly brief it. So this is the civil application members. Um, you can see the principal members of all the Fed Civ members and also the associate members. So we work closely with the DOD community and also DHS. And it's just a um, interagency group that uh, gets together once a month. Um, and our specialty is uh, remote sensing. So um, we welcome anybody that wants to attend these meetings. These are open. Uh, the Fed Civ members and also um, associate members that are help are supporting a federal agency as well. Logos under principal DAOI, USDA, DOC, DOT, DOH, EPA, NASA, NSF, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, DOD, TVA logos under ex officio ODNI, EOP. BSG and SG logos under Associate DHS, DIA, NSG, NRO, DOS, and DOE. And this is just the next slide of the triple junction slide of, of where the CAC falls in from the intelligence community, Department of Defense, and Fed agencies. So um, we provide oversight as well. So not anyone can just uh, request um, a commercial imagery. Like I said, it has to be uh, supporting a U.S. government mission, but there is oversight in this where um, you can't just uh, start tasking requirements without um, being um, adjudicated by um, the Civil Application Committee. Title CAC at the Triple Junction. The Civil Applications Committee operates at the triple junction of the intelligence, defense, and federal civil communities on geospatial intelligence and remote sensing issues. Their circles overlap with arrow to center where they all overlap. The three labels of the circles include intelligence community, Department of Defense, and federal civil. So uh, hopefully I didn't go over 20 minutes, but uh, if people have questions, uh... I know Joe, can you hear me for uh, if you want to facilitate those questions or I could just um, try to answer it within the chat. Speaker Joe Hink. 
Yeah, we're um, we're we're. I think I'm going to direct you to the chat. There are a few questions about resolution and that sort of thing. Contact InfoJ, Stephen Hall Source Management U.S. Geological Survey Hack at usgs.govjame.hack at nga.mil phone 703648615. And we'll, uh, we're going to try Sam again. That um, got us just a minute or two behind. Uh, I do have some time possibly at the very end <laughs> for open questions if uh, folks can stay on and we can circle back. Um, let's see. So, Sam, can you try sharing yours again? Speaker Sam Richman. Well, first, let's see. Can you hear me? Speaker Joe Hank. Yes, I yeah, can hear okay. you. Okay. Speaker Sam Richman. Okay, great. Uh, let me go hop over to the screen. The joys of multiple screens. And all right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thanks for the technical difficulties. Um, we are excited to share with you some of our research on living pilings. Uh, this is a project that is demonstrating uh, to have some promising um, applications for subtitle restoration with broad applications to any urban estuary. Additional title a novel approach to enhancing subtitle habitats injured by coastal oil spills. Dars, Simitha Richman, and Susan De La Cruz. U.S. Geological Survey, Western Ecological Research Center, San Francisco Bay Estuary Field Station. S. Richman at usgs.gov and De La Cruz at usgs.gov. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Natalie Manning and Carolyn Marn, as, along with the Kosky Busan Trustee Council for supporting this project, as well as the entire team at the San Francisco Bay Estuary Field Station. None of this work could have been done without them. Logo for DOI, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Photos of Susan De La Cruz, Isa Wu, Stacy Moskal, Tanya Graham. Lori Hall, Dave Nelson, Rupak Bat, Christina Ananino, William Chan, Kristen Steed, and Mason Hill. Uh, so in 2007, a container ship hit the Bay Bridge, releasing about 53,000 gallons of bunker fuel oil, which spread rapidly in the South Bay, the North Bay, or sorry, Central Bay, and the Outer Coast. And this caused extensive injury to wildlife, as well as thousands of acres of shoreline and subtitle habitat. Uh, as well as a pretty good chunk of our Pacific herring spawn that year, along with their uh, spawning habitat. More than 6,849 birds lost, 36% sea ducks. More than 25% Pacific herring spawn 2007 to 08. More than 3,367 acres of shoreline habitat. Rocky shorelines, beach, salt marsh. Subtitle habitat, eelgrass meadows. Photos of the container ship, aerial photo of the San Francisco Bay. Changes to photo of birds and aerial image of the bay with Golden Gate Bridge. Now, over the years, we've had the opportunity to work on several restoration projects in the bay, including living shorelines, as well as a prey enhancement study using a raft aquaculture technique. And both of these projects uh, show immense ecological value. Uh, but one thing they have in common is a high cost of construction to create the habitat in which we're trying to restore. Tidal living shorelines, oyster and eelgrass. Two photos include one of shell bag mound and eelgrass. The other is a reef ball. On the other side, the title is prey enhancement sea ducks. Herring eggs of kelp, H-E-O-K mussel ropes. A photo of two people standing on a boat looking and pointing at the water, where there is a large metal raft on top of the water, with strings going across to each side in the water. So building upon this work, we took elements of both projects to develop living pilings, uh, which is goal is to repurpose existing infrastructure like derelict piers and pilings using a piling encapsulation technique to create non-toxic subtitle habitat, and if we can recruit some shellfish, maybe some food for some ducks. See ducks, of course. Four photos with arrows that point to the next one to the right. The first is birds sitting on pilings with labeled derelict piling. 
Next is a photo of a person adding tall cover on pile with label pile encapsulation. Third photo is a clean pile cover next to a pile covered in habitat with label subtitle habitat. The last photo is of sea ducks around a pile with the label prey resources. So San Francisco Bay, like any urban estuary, has thousands of derelict piers and pilings, um, over 30,000 to be exact. Uh, and many of these are within the traditional herring spawning zone shown here in yellow. Map of the San Francisco Bay with color indicators along the shorelines for SFEI mapping, NOAA mapping, and historical herring spawning areas. Photo of a Pacific herring and another photo of birds on pilings. Now, pulling out these pilings is not only expensive, but it requires heavy machinery and disposal of hazardous material. Photo of a crane on a boat next to the shoreline holding large machine next to a person and a piling. Photo changes to people fishing on a pier with lots of pilings in the water around it. And as a result, we often leave the pilings in place and just build a new pier right next to it. Now, removal, of course, is preferred, but there are cases where pilings are ineligible for removal. If they're in sensitive habitat, they are habitat, or they might have historical value. Photo of birds on pilings in the water and another photo of a historic pier. So for the pilings that remain, they continue to leach creosote, and this is known to affect both the growth and survival of fish and invertebrates that are in direct contact with the wood. Tidal derelict creosote treated timber pilings, CTP, 90% polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAH photo of a piling and graphic different fish from vines at all 2000. They also deteriorate, break, become marine debris, and uh, significant navigational hazards for boats. Photo of broken piling in the water. Other photo is lots of broken piling pieces stacked up. So this project was set up in three phases. Uh, phase one was site planning and permitting. Um, and I hate to gloss over this because it was two years of my life, but there you go, half of a single slide. Uh, we're currently in phase two. Uh, we completed installation and in our first year of site monitoring. We're now in year two and analyzing samples in the lab. At the end, I will share with you some of the work that we would like to do in the future um, and some ideas that we have. So let me fly you into our study site uh, here in San Francisco Bay relative to where the accident occurred. We're going to head up to the Tiburon Peninsula on the eastern shore, and this is our living piling site. Okay, this is the old El Campo Marina. It was originally installed in 1960 and uh, dismantled a few years later. Uh, it is over 60 years old, so pilings are in various states of deterioration. Uh, some pilings, the dark circles, are in fairly good shape, uh, but then we've got pilings that are deteriorating quite rapidly or have broken completely. Uh, the red ones are pilings that we have lost in this last year. An aerial view of the El Campo Marina, with marks on each piling that indicate the different levels of deterioration. Photo of piling in good condition with label less than 25%. Photo of piling that has signs of deterioration with label 50%. Photo of piling that has a lot of deterioration with label greater than 75%. Photo of piling that has been broken off. So to repair pilings, uh, for this project, we wanted to use commercially available materials. So here are some of the basic types of piling repair options uh, that are out there. Uh, there is the wrap with uh, polyethylene or some form of membrane or fiberglass. Um, this does not provide any structural support, but it does cover the creosote. Uh, the jacket method uh, wraps around the piling and it can be secured directly to the wood or you could backfill with concrete. Uh, the most common uh, is using concrete with a fiber form uh, and then that fiber form is removed and you have a concrete piling. Uh, this is uh, more for piers and docks when you need structural support. Three graphic steps of wrapping the piling and nailing it. Two photos of workers wrapping a piling. Photo of person in shallow water holding up a large jacket covering onto a piling. 
another photo of a worker pouring concrete into mold around the piling. Additional photo appears with a finished concrete fiber form around the piling. So concrete is obviously the most expensive of the three. Uh, we chose to use the jacket method because it was right there in the middle. Uh, it's fairly durable, easy to install, uh, and relatively low cost. These are the two jackets that we tested in this study. The snap jacket is made out of a flexible PVC material. Uh, this PVC is rated for potable water, so it's the same PVC that you would use in plumbing in your house. Uh, it does have a smooth surface, however. Uh, the Denso Sea Shield is a rigid fiberglass, and it does have a little bit of surface texture. Not a lot, but it does have a little. Photos of snap jacket and Denso Sea Shield with close-up of each. Now, we wanted to encourage recruitment and enhance surface area, um, especially for our shellfish and, and other invertebrates. Uh, so we used uh, an aluminum and a fiberglass screen um, to um, wrap around the pilings for the areas underwater. Photos of aluminum and fiberglass screens in rolls and a close-up of each. Installation was fairly easy from a flat-bottomed boat or kayaks. Um, no heavy machinery was used. The jacket opens up lengthwise and you can slide it right down the piling. It's then secured with stainless steel screws. Now, because many of the tops of the pilings were tapered, we didn't want any birds to fall between the jacket and the wood. So we used a uh, wooden deck tile and this ended up acting as a roosting platform at the same time. Photos of workers on boats sliding the jacket onto the pilings. Another photo of a wood platform and a piling that is tapered. Uh, here is the final installation for the snap jacket on the left and the denso on the right. Uh, and uh, you can see here those black lines. Uh, those are our meter marks to give us a sense of water depth when we're out there. Uh, here's the schematic of our treatments uh, for the two jacket types, snap jacket in gray, denso sea shield in uh, yellow. Uh, we then had uh, jackets alone, jackets with aluminum treatments, and jackets with the fiberglass screen. And then we had two control creosote treated pilings, uh, some in their natural state, and then ones that we cleaned so we can do a comparison uh, at time zero. This is a schematic of our treatment assignments. It is in a randomized complete block design with rows as blocks for statistical geeks out there. Uh, we did sample both the inner title and subtitle at four cardinal directions. Diagram showing all of the living piling treatments with letters and numbers for each one. There is a key that indicates the treatment type that include non-treatment, brocum, control, natural, control scraped. Snap jacket control, snap jacket aluminum, snap jacket fiberglass, denso control, denso aluminium, and denso fiberglass. Graphic of a piling with labels for 3 meter, 2 meter intertidal, and 1 meter subtital. Uh, to better assess the growth on the pilings through time, uh, for each of the treatments, we used settling plates that were attached directly to uh, the jacket for each of the treatments. Uh, and then we could bring them back into the lab to look a little bit more closely. Photos of settling plates for snap jacket control, aluminum, and fiberglass. And another photo of denso settling plates for control, aluminum, and fiberglass. Uh, we did do eelgrass surveys prior to installation to make sure we were choosing pilings that were not near any eelgrass shoots. Photo of eelgrass in water and a photo of an aerial video of the site with highlighted area of grass. For site monitoring to measure the growth on pilings through time, uh, we looked at percent live cover, biodiversity and species richness, abundance, biomass. Uh, we're also paying close attention to the ratio of native to non-native species. Uh, we sampled quarterly for the first year, and I'm gonna show you a short video at three months, and then a whole bunch of settling plates from six months and 12 months post-installation. Diagram of site monitoring. Arrows point to the right. First label pre-installation fall 2020. Installation winter 2020 through 21, three months. Spring 2021, six months. Summer 2021, nine months. And fall 2021, 12 months. Uh, this is a video of the Denso control, uh, so no surface treatment. 
Uh, as we get down, um, you'll see a little bit more. Please forgive the video quality. We're using an inexpensive uh, fishing camera. Um, hopefully a GoPro would be better, but as we get down, we'll get past the ulva species and in some coralline algae, lots of filamentous algae. Uh, but what I want you to see here is as that filamentous algae moves out of the way, you can see uh, our invertebrate community behind it. Uh, more than anything, I want you to get a sense of our three-dimensional scape that we are working with. Um, please note too, this is a three months post installation and winter months at that. So now I'm going to show you a whole bunch of settling plates. So hold on to your hats. I will have the snap jacket on the left. That's the PVC jacket. And then the denso on the right. That's the fiberglass jacket. I'm going to first show you inner title from our six month samples. Uh, and they were fairly similar in both composition as well as percent live cover, algae and barnacles as early uh, recruits. Looking at the aluminum surface treatment, fairly similar on the exterior, but when we removed the surface treatment, there was quite a bit of growth underneath, and the denso had extremely high densities of, of barnacles. Looking at the fiberglass screen, um, again, similar on the exterior, uh, but not a lot of growth uh, underneath. A few barnacles, but not very many. Now looking at subtitles, so now we're under one meter of water. Uh, we did have um, a lot of growth. Again, this is only at six months. Uh, looking at the aluminum, uh, we have um, lots of algae, but now looking underneath the aluminum screen uh, for the denso, um, substantially higher densities of barnacles. Uh, looking at the fiberglass screen, uh, one thing I want you to notice here is the sediment. Uh, the screen did clog quite quickly uh, with sediment looking underneath the screen. Uh, not a lot of growth, um, although the denso, the, it's hard to see with the reflection, but those are thousands of baby barnacles uh, as well as some uh, tube worms. Okay, so now I'm going to look at 12 months, so a year in the water. Uh, I'm going to have inner title at the top and subtitle at the bottom. Uh, we do have similar for our control jackets. This is without a surface treatment. Uh, far more uh, larger species diversity for our subtitle. We're now seeing some encrusting bryozoans and sponges and coral and algaes. Uh, and we are making a concerted effort in the lab to um, identify native and non-native species. Looking at the aluminum surface treatment uh, underneath the jackets or underneath the screen rather. Um, now we are seeing um, oysters and mussel spat, which I will admit I was jumping for joy. Uh, looking at subtitle, again, we've got uh, some oysters and some mussel spat. Um, same thing with our denso, um, more oysters and mussel spat. And this is uh, natural recruitment. Looking at the fiberglass screen, however, uh, this screen did clog, so not a lot of growth either on top or under. Uh, same thing with the subtitle. Um, although for the denso, we did have um, a few oysters settled. Okay, uh, here's an overview of what we've seen. Um, we are still processing samples in the lab um, and identifying taxa down to the species level. Uh, but here are broad taxonomic groups uh, for algaes, bryozoans, bivalves, crustaceans, polychaetes, sponges, and tunicates. Uh, for our creosote treated pilings that were cleaned versus the snap jacket, which is the PVC, and the denso, which is fiberglass, with their respective uh, surface treatments. Uh, I apologize, this table is a little bit busy, but what I want to point out here is that denso across the board had higher densities, um, or sorry, a greater diversity of species present. Uh, looking at the fiberglass screen, uh, we did have quite a few species there, but comparatively much lower. Uh, looking at the bivalves, uh, oysters, mussels, we did have natural recruitment and extremely high densities of barnacles. Just to summarize that uh, real quick, uh, the snap jacket once again is PVC. It has a smooth surface compared to the Denso Sea Shield, which is a rigid fiberglass and it does have a little bit of surface texture. 
In terms of percent live cover, uh, we had similar 60 to 100 percent um, versus 80 to 100 percent. The denso was consistently higher um, and biodiversity was also higher on the denso as well. Snap jacket 12 plus, denso 14 plus. Uh, barnacle density was moderate for the snap jacket, but extremely high for the denso sea shield. And we did have natural recruitment of both oysters and mussels. Uh, I am waiting to uh, see some more samples in the lab uh, to see how many mussels we may have had. Uh, looking at the surface treatments in terms of durability, Unfortunately, the aluminum um, had high recruitment, but it was not very durable. Um, it did tear and break down in the marine environment uh, compared to the fiberglass. However, the fiberglass did clog quite quickly. Uh, in terms of, oops, right, wrong slide. In terms of recruitment, oh, it didn't go away. In terms of recruitment, uh, the aluminum was much higher than uh, fiberglass. Uh, so overall, uh, the Denso Sea Shield, the fiberglass jacket um, was um, had higher recruitment and diversity relative to the snap jacket, uh, probably as a result of that surface texture. Um, for the surface treatments that we tested, uh, the aluminum had extremely high recruitment, but it was not very durable. Uh, perhaps testing a heavier gauge wire, larger mesh size, or a different material uh, could provide uh, the same refugia. What we think um, is happening is uh, free-floating larvae are able to pass through that screen, and it provides a little microhabitat behind, which gives them an opportunity to adhere to the jacket. Um, this might be uh, something to look into more in the future. Photo of the top of a Denso and Snap Jacket pilings. Graphic of aluminum and fiberglass with close up of each. In terms of cost of materials, uh, which of course is what budgets often uh, boil down to, um, I want to say that this does not include installation, um, and the cost of materials will vary tremendously um, with piling diameter and height, which is function of water depth. And most of that cost is associated with freight and shipping. Um, but the snap jacket was about $560 versus the Denso Sea Shield at $820 per individual piling. Um, this is only a difference of about $260. Bucks. Um, for the amount of recruitment that we had as quickly as we did and natural recruitment of oysters and mussels, uh, this is a pretty good bang for your buck. Um, I'd also like to point out that deck tile that we used as a bird platform was only 25 bucks at Home Depot and the birds uh, took to them quite quickly. Photos of a Denso and a snap jacket with deck tile platform. Another photo of birds on the platform on top of a covered piling. Uh, so overall, these um, jackets are shown um, as just one piling encapsulation technique using a piling repair jacket. Uh, these jackets were easy to install, relatively low cost, and we had up to 100% live cover within a year of deployment, along with natural recruitment of oysters and mussels. We are still processing and we are still looking for native and non-native species. Now, the ecological benefits, um, wrapping these creosote pilings will reduce or could reduce and eliminate contaminant leaching from the creosote. Uh, provide a non-toxic surface for vital fish and invertebrate populations, as well as create vertical structure for fish habitat. And if we can get more mussels, uh, it could potentially provide a novel food resource for marine birds, like sea ducks. Photos of person encapsulating a piling, an underwater photo of pilings. Close-up photo of oysters and mussels. Last photo is of sea ducks. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, first thing, uh, we need to complete uh, year two of site monitoring. Uh, we would love to install more of the Denso Sea Shield and expand to other sites. Uh, I'm going to show you a few ideas that we have uh, to accelerate some recruitment. Additional text on screen evaluate methods to accelerate recruitment of native species. Bouchot culture technique with native mussels. Surface complexity and rugosity. Uh, one idea is to use a muscle aquaculture approach called the Bouchot, which is commonly used in uh, Europe. Uh, this takes uh, muscle socks and wraps them around poles to grow out uh, to pretty high densities of muscles, uh, which could feed a whole lot of ducks. 
Uh, we recently found a hatchery in Southern California uh, that is rearing uh, native mussels. Uh, we would love to test this in the Bay, although it might be a permitting nightmare. Three photos of different bowchip methods. Photo of a person holding mussels. A close-up photo of Mitellus californianus. Photo odd very small Mitellus on rope. Another photo of bowchot ropes with logo for Holdfast Aquaculture. Um, we are also working with some colleagues to um, see if we can enhance our surface complexity or what's called rugosity. Uh, critters like edges, bumps, grooves, peaks, valleys, or anything that has water retention. Um, and this can enhance recruitment quite quickly. Five photos of different surface designs with various textures. Logo for Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Additional text on screen includes CCA Architecture and Architectural Ecologies Lab. Um, we would also love to evaluate um, the traditional concrete pilings and a new material called e-concrete. Uh, this is a bioenhancing concrete, and if you haven't heard of e-concrete before, uh, please do check it out. Uh, it's really interesting stuff, and some of their studies have shown that because of this rugosity and the material that they're using, that they are having a higher native to non-native species composition, uh, giving native species a competitive advantage over those non-native species. Additional text on screen includes Sella and Perkle. Finkel 2015, blue is the new green. Equal Engineering 84 to 260, 272. Uh, so using existing infrastructure like piers and pilings uh, could reduce our overall cost for habitat restoration. We have thousands of derelict pilings. Uh, they are quite abundant in any urban estuary. Uh, we also have active piers, wharfs, bridges, as well as private docks. Um, and we have a lot of pilings that are under construction or repair. If we have this infrastructure in the water, why not use it, what we already have? And this is very much in tune with the Army Corps of Engineers Engineering with Nature initiative. Photo of birds on pilings. Map of the San Francisco Bay with color indicators along the shorelines for SFEI mapping, NOAA mapping, and historical herring spawning areas. Logo for Engineering with Nature and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And with that, I don't know if I have any time, but I would be happy to answer any questions. Speaker Joe Hink. Thanks so much, Sam. I think we're going to um, move on to the last set of speakers and just I would direct your attention to the chat because there was some um, chatter going on in there. Uh, Speaker Sam Richman. I heard it, but I couldn't see it. <laughs> Speaker Joe Hink. Well, we'll take a look. Thank you so much. Really fascinating work. Um, all right, folks, we've made it to the last talk of this session, and it's going to be, we're going to have three speakers. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Patty Bright. She's a C senior science advisor with USGS. And Patty has extensive expertise in the field of One Health and emerging disease threats, understanding how interactions among people, wild and domesticated animals, and the environment affect the risk of exposure to toxicological and infectious disease agents and in the field of emergency preparedness. So I think Patty uh, is going to start off the slide deck, but we also have uh, Dr. Jessica Leach, who is a research toxicologist at the USGS Columbia Environmental Research Center in Columbia, Missouri. Jessica's current research is on effects of environmental contaminants on fish development, reproduction, and immune function with an emphasis mm -hmm. on endocrine disrupting yeah. compounds. And then well, Barnett Ragnar is oh, also you, going to be presenting. Is, uh, hold on, let me just... And he is a scientist with the Eastern Ecological Science Center of the USGS, and he conducts research on regional, national, and international scopes that entails hypothesis-driven laboratory and field investigations, risk assessment, and scholar scholarly evaluations of legacy and contemporary pollutants to the wildlife and the environment. And many of you all may have actually worked with uh, Barnett over the past three decades as he served as an advisor to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 
on a variety of topics, including the evaluation of potentially safe alternatives to lead used in ammunition and fishing tackle. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to the team of three and thank you all uh, <laughs> for joining us. Speaker Patty Bright. Thank you. My apologies. I am having some issues getting my slides to move. Speaker Joe Hank. I am seeing them move on this end, Patty. Speaker Patty Bright. Okay. Yeah, but I can't get back to the first slide for some reason. It's not letting me do that. I don't know why. Okay, there we go. All right. No. Huh. Okay, I don't know what is going on here. Speaker Joe Hank. I do see the arrows on my screen down at the bottom. It's showing yeah, it seems slide to have taken out, out. Speaker Patty Bright. Well, that's really odd. It seems to have taken out the first couple of slides, which I just had up a minute ago. Huh. I am so sorry about this. Give me a second here. Let me see what's going on. Just had this up and tried it, and it worked. And now, all right. Which are you seeing the first slide now? The title slide. Speaker Joe Hank. I'm seeing a slide that says protection goals. Speaker Patty Bright. All right. Hold on one second. I apologize. Let me stop sharing. Try this again. Speaker Joe Hank. Well, it wouldn't be a you know virtual meeting if we didn't have a little bit of technical. Speaker Patty Bright. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm just really frustrated. I even tried this all out to make sure everything was working. Speaker Joe Hank. The best Patty, laid plans, right? Speaker Jessica Leet. Patty, it looks like that protection goals was the first slide in the shared presentation. I think that was the next one after the title slide, correct? Speaker Patty Bright. No, it wasn't. It was, oh, okay. um, there's like four slides in front of it. So I am sorry. I don't know why. All right, let me just, uh, you know what? Let me go into my computer and stop sharing. And I will just go in and pull this out of my, um, out of my folder. That'll work better. I don't know. I literally just had it up and it seemed to be working fine. So. Speaker Joe Hank. It's going to give the audience just a few more minutes, Patty, to wrap around what beyond toxicity testing, what are, what are we doing? <laughs> what does the future hold? <laughs> Speaker Patty Bright. All right. Otherwise, I can sock puppet the first couple of slides. I don't know. Speaker Joe Hank. Hey, there, that'd be new to the meeting. I haven't seen that That would yet. be. I, you know. <laughs> Speaker Patty Bright. We're flexible and adaptable. We're always resilient here. <laughs> okay. It looks like it's trying to open it. There we go, I hope. Speaker Jessica Leet. Now we see it. Speaker Patty Bright. All right, now if we can get us in presentation mode here. All right, um, are you guys, you guys are probably seeing a strange screen though, not the presentation mode, right? Speaker Joe Hank. No, it looked good when you first brought it on. It's showing slide four though now on my screen. Okay. Speaker Patty Bright. All right. Okay, great. All right. Well, sorry for that, you guys, but you're right. It wouldn't be a virtual meeting if somebody didn't have a problem. So anyway, thank you so much for uh, mm -hmm. for inviting us to speak at this, Joe. Uh, we really appreciate having the opportunity to do that and to kind of bring a slightly different perspective to the meeting. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about animal welfare and animal use alternatives. And we wanted to start out just giving you just a kind of a quick background on why we're doing this. So um, you may be aware that there is an interagency coordinating committee on the validation of alternative methods and or known as ICVAM, and they were established back in 2000. Um, and their um, focus is really on increasing the effectiveness of federal agency efforts to replace, reduce and refine the use of animals for toxicity testing. And this is traditionally known as the three R's. And so um, back in 2019, GAO um produced a report called the Animal Use and Research Report. And as part of that report, they had some recommendations. So in the report, they noted that while most agencies actively promote the three R's, um, most don't actually have metrics in place to demonstrate the effectiveness of their efforts. 
So they made some recommendations regarding metrics and some other things. And so right now there is an ongoing government wide effort to develop metrics and track progress on the three R's and the alternative methods. So there's 17 federal agencies that are involved in this effort, including DOI. And as I'm sure many of you know, DOI has a number of activities that are toxicologically related. Those include things like ecotox research and testing, contaminant biomonitoring, damage assessment, diagnostics, product approval. And many of these activities either entail animal use or alternative in vitro or in silica methods. So that's kind of the basis for our conversation today. So I just wanted to talk for a minute about the three R's. As I said, um, the three R's are really um, are the guiding principles for more ethical use of animals in product testing and research. These were first described back in 1959 by Russell and Birch. And while the traditional three R's form the background for animal alternative approaches, the, develop of kind of, the development of kind of these new alternative approaches that involve hazard and risk assessment of chemicals really require something a little bit more, right? So they require this entire body of six R's. So what we're now talking about um, when we talk about ecotoxicology is really the six R's. So we're talking about replacement, we're talking about reduction, we're talking about refinement, but then we're also talking about reproducibility, relevance, and regulatory acceptance. Lilla Crap et al. 2016, Environ Toxical Chem, Volume 35. Number 11, page 2637 through 46. So we'll talk a little bit more about these as we go through today. But just very quickly, so this whole idea of kind of animal welfare and ecotoxicology. So we're looking at um, kind of the development of new and the refinement of existing procedures for assessing the effects of potentially toxic chemicals in some wildlife species. Um, what we know is that some wildlife species have received kind of relatively uh, limited, um, rel there's been relatively limited effort in some wildlife species as compared to fish. So, for example, in amphibians, reptiles, some mammalian species, um, bird species. But thankfully, in the last 20 years, these efforts have really been expanded out. And so we're looking more at developing scaling and extrapolation efforts derived that have been derived from traditional avian and mammalian species. And while these are, um, while the development of new and the refinement of the existing procedures for assessing the effects of toxic chemicals in wildlife species has uh, kind of grown, we do know that some of these methods, while they have value for extrapolating uh, median lethal dose estimates to protect to predict the um, potential toxicity of chemicals in wildlife species, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, particularly when we're looking at predictions that entail large taxonomic differences or for those compounds with um, you know, that have limited data or for end, or have endpoints other than mortality. So we recognize that there's a real need to kind of move this effort forward, particularly within DOI. And so one of the things that we're doing in response to the GAO recommendations is that we are developing an, a specific course in combination with USDA, with their Animal Welfare Information Center, and some of you may have taken, there is an animal welfare information course that is offered by USDA. And it's um, it's a two-day course. It's traditionally been offered in person at uh, Beltsville, Maryland, although they've started offering virtually with COVID. Um, and it is a requirement for folks that are working with animals. But what we were interested in doing was looking at how do we kind of target this course more towards what DOI is doing? Um, how do we target specifically towards kind of ecotoxicology type related issues? And then we also want to use this course as sort of a metric to kind of look at from the GAO perspective, you know, how do we measure the success we're having in kind of training and getting folks involved in this? So the course is scheduled for Wednesday, November 30th. It's going to be a half day course. Um, I've kind of laid out an overview of what some of the topics will be. Overview, AWA and regulations, 3R's alternative concept and 3R organizations, 3R's literature and resources. Panel discussion focused on new methods with a focus on those relevant to DOI's interests and activities. Registration is free. Um, so we will be sending out invites to a number of folks within uh, DOI, but also if you're on this call, we'll, um, we'll reach out to Joe and ask Joe that also forward that, uh, that invite to you. So you should be seeing that in the next uh, two weeks. So I'm gonna turn it now over to Barnett. So Barnett, if you wanna go ahead and sure. unmute yourself. Speaker Barnett Ratner. Um, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Um, 
Sure. So um, for the past 18 months, I've been participating in a virtual workshop about risk assessment in the 21st century. And um, it's really been enlightening to me. Um, not NERDA, but pesticide registration and approval of industrial chemicals from an ecotoxicological perspective, there's tremendous focus on survival, growth, and reproduction. Photo of a fish, birds, ducks, mouse. And a lot of the data for those types of approval or registration activities are really laboratory guideline studies, very strict um, GLP protocols need to be followed. Let's go to the next slide. Um, there you go. Well, um, some of my colleagues, particularly in the EPA, consider the NERDA work and um, CERCLA type work at Superfund sites a little bit of the Wild West compared to pesticide registration and um, approval of um, industrial use chemicals because all kinds of supplemental lines of evidence. Photo of two men on horses trying to catch a horse. Photo of concert on top of sticks. An aerial map. Two photos of birds. A graphic of a bird in visual diagrams of a neonicotinoid insecticide reduces fueling and delays migration in songbirds. Speaker Patty Bright. Barnett, are you still there? Speaker Barnett Ratner. Me, I hope um, you can hear me again. Yep, we can. Great. So let's jump on um, to the next slide. And um, my thought here, here was how might alternative methods fit into natural resource damage assessment and restoration? Well, the first thing is, if you are going to use animals, what is the appropriate sample size? And here, um, one has to consider the effect size and corresponding uncertainty. And you know, there are all kinds of things can be statistically significant. But for NRDA, we really have to think in terms of biological significance and designing studies with the fewest numbers of animals, uh, but nonetheless wanting to prove or show biological significance. Another important thing to consider is not sample size, that is animals, but the size of the biological sample. I cannot tell you how many times a study is run and a sample was small and just did not permit high quality analysis of residues. Another alternative uh, method that might fit into um, natural resource damage assessment is the use of minimally invasive and non-invasive sampling and sublethal endpoints. And uh, this can have really a big role in NRDAs, uh, but sometimes in traditional pesticide registration or industrial um, chemical approval for use, those types of effects, minimally invasive, sublethal, just don't come into play. Let's move on to the next slide. The next slide talks about new approach methodologies. And these are technologies, methods, and approaches that can be used to provide important chemical hazard and risk information without using animals. Um, there have been major advances in in vitro screening in the past 20 years using cell-based systems to study enzymes and receptor targets, and certainly PCR arrays to study gene expression. Some high throughput screening programs like Tox, ToxCast and Tox21 have literally examined thousands of chemicals at many different dose levels in 30 different cell or biochemical assay type um, systems. Um, they've proven very valuable in identifying mode of action of very diverse groups of chemicals. Um, colleagues in Canada, Doug Crump, Jessica Head, Nils Basu, they've developed something called the Ecotox chip that examines gene expression in quail and frogs and even other species of wildlife beyond what is traditionally done in Mallard and Bob White. Photo of vitro screening, a machine arm, and a graphic with numbers in the background and DNA strand. Um, their vision is that um, some early life stage embryo models in um, the... Speaker Patty Bright. You cut out again, Barnett. Speaker Barnett Ratner. 
In my back. Speaker Patty Bright. Yes. Speaker Barnett Ratner. Great. Um, I'm sorry it keeps cutting out. Um, so they really have this Ecotox chip, which has tremendous screening possibilities. Let's go on to the next slide. I don't drop out. Um, well, what are some other new approach methodologies? Well, these are not so new. They go back uh, 40 and 50 years. Um, qualitative and quantitative structure activity relationships, their mathematical models looking at biological activity of um, chemicals, uh, matching them with physiochemical properties of those same chemicals to make predictions about structurally related chemicals. Then there's read across, which is kind of a data gap filling technique. Basically information from data rich substances are used to relate um, data from uh, perhaps data poor substances that are structurally related. Let's go on to the next slide. Diagram on left with chemical breakdown with labels for steric bulk here is good. Steric bulk here is bad. Plus VE here is good and negative VE here is good. Chart on right has an image of mouse and bird with data for tested and not tested. Title below chart is integrating data from different species and chemicals. The next is uh, AOPs, which um, adverse outcome pathways, which are kind of a conceptual framework derived uh, by organizing existing knowledge about a toxic substance and applying um, that um, to predict effects beyond the molecular and cellular level to what might go on at the individual or population level. This is kind of a lofty goal, but a lot of activity in this area that might have application for NRDAs. And um, this, uh, uh, the EPA, for example, has an ecotox knowledge base with all kinds of uh, databases and sites to draw information to build AOPs and to conduct systematic reviews. Additional text on screen includes documentation of relationships for ecologically relevant endpoints required. On the side, there are piles of papers and curved arrows that go down to the next item. From the top, the items are molecular, cellular, tissue, organ, organismal, population. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, how might new approach methodologies fit into NRDA? Well, there's all kinds of modeling activities out there today. These are some data from Carolyn Meyer that examined a hypothetical island population of herring gull chicks um, exposed to lead in flaking paint chips. And she used data from laboratory studies and um, uh, created some dose response curves. Um, applied some of that to field settings and made some predictions based on lead in soil, what might have to be the concentration in soil to really affect the um, population of breeding herring uh, uh, gull chicks, um, uh, you know, years from now in this island ecosystem. Uh, so there are a lot of modeling approaches out there that might certainly have application to what is done in NRDA. Bean, Meyer, et al. SETAC, NA 2021, abstract 03.05.11. At this point, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Speaker Jessica Leet. Thanks, Barnett. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into um, giving you a few more specific examples of some available uh, more aquatic focus methods that could potentially be employed um, in assessments of risk or injury. Um, so you can see here just um, an example of non-animal methods. So, for example, a yeast assays that don't use animal models or animal cells. Oh, our slides got knocked off. <laughs> we are just having all sorts of technical difficulties. I'm not sure if. Patty can share her screen again. Um, but I'll continue talking for the moment. <laughs> um, but those assays can be used, um, for example, to test um, endocrine activity in either contaminants of interest or field samples. 
um, of interest to, for example, prioritize field sites. Um, other uh, examples of methods that can be used uh, might require a little bit more expertise or equipment um, in order to conduct these assessments. So for instance, um, using like primary cell cultures from liver or anterior kidney from field samples um, or non-invasive samples uh, or less invasive samples such as um, blood samples and looking at flow cytometry um, to look at blood cell profiles or taking transcriptomic approach and looking at um, gene expression profiles uh, of different samples taken from field sites. Um, could give you a lot more information and potentially reduce the amount of animal sampling that needs to be done um, to gain assessment of the type of injury that, that may be occurring at that site. Photo of a metal tool, cell plates, laboratory computer and machine, person performing a test, person in water taking samples, and a line diagram. And then if you'll move ahead, Patty. Thanks. And so, an, oh back one. <laughs> but another um, tool that can also be used to reduce animal use in toxicity testing um, is the use of fish embryos. These are not considered animals when they are prior to um, external feeding stage. And various fish species can be used for these types of assessments, mm -hmm. but most widely used is the zebrafish or the Danio rario. Um, as the model, they're easy to spawn. Um, when they do spawn, if they spawn in large quantities and the uh, embryo and larval stages are transparent, which makes it extremely easy um, to view and assess different organ development. They're also used widely as a model of human health and um, vertebrate development. And so, uh, there is a lot of molecular tools and information out there and resources for using zebrafish, for example, in these different embryo tests. And you can see there an example of a workflow um, with spawning embryos, um, assessing them, and then loading them into these plates. And um, OECD does have a standardized guideline. It's called the FET, so the Fish Embryo Early Life Stage Toxicity Test. And it is uh, mostly focused on uh, overt toxicity endpoints like survival and hatching and um, general malformations. And Lammer et al. 2009 https colon forward slash forward slash do i dot org forward slash 10 dot 1016 forward slash j dot cbpc dot 2008 dot 11 dot 006. How do you feel? Go forward to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is an example of a more um, targeted assay. So these can also be employed to get down to more uh, information beyond just overt toxicity and survival, um, but to look at more to gain information about that, but also gain information about mode of action of a particular um, contaminant that's of interest or as I mentioned before, you can also use these assays for field samples or extracts from field samples. Um, so they can be used to prioritize uh, further testing for contaminants or to prioritize different field sites and um, make an assessment of potential toxicity risk at those sites. And so the example I've got here on this slide is of a developmental cardiovascular tox assay. Um, so this can assess functional endpoints in addition to morphological endpoints. Um, so endpoints including um, morphological endpoints of like body length and intersegmental vessel area and pericardial area. So looking at heart development and um, vessel development, as well as heart rate and circulation of the blood as the functional endpoints that it can also assess in a semi-automated fashion. And this does require specialized imaging equipment. Um, but again, this model of using zebrafish embryos is extremely flexible um, to hone in on whatever endpoints are most relevant to the case that you're looking at. And shortening that time point from the FET test that I mentioned in the previous slide to a 72 hour time point allows for, if you can see the example there at the top of the pictures, um, using a 384 well format instead of the um, uh, the larger well format 
um, in order to increase your sample size and reduce the amount of the test material that you need for, for your testing. Image of fish in tank. Image of FITC image of zebrafish. A transmitted light image of zebrafish. Photo of the molecular devices image express high contrast imaging system. And so if you'll go to the last slide, Patty, um, we wanted to present this information today as just kind of some food for thought um, for, you know, different methods that are available. Um, hopefully is getting your minds thinking a little bit about potentially how different available methods or methods that are being developed could be used to reduce the amount of animal use in different assessments. Um, Ecotox testing tends to trail a little bit behind human health or medical advancements, but we are consistently pulling um, from those newly developed technologies um, to be able to apply them to Ecotox testing. And so, um, again, we just wanted to present this as kind of some food for thought of some areas where these methods might be used. And Barnett, feel free to jump in as well to add your two cents. Speaker Barnett Ratner. I guess my two cents are is um, I'm a uh, empirical evidence type scientist, but I do recognize and see um, tremendous advancements um, uh, with predictions being made from in vitro type studies to whole animals, certainly in the human health area, perhaps some. Speaker Patty Bright. We lost you again, Barnett. Well, we thank everybody for your attention on this topic. We know it's a little bit um, out of the wheelhouse of the rest of the talks, but we thank you for your attention. Speaker Joe Hank. Yes, thank, thank you, um, Patty Barnett and, and Jessica for that. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I'm talking with folks kind of behind the scene. We're not for sure what's going on, but do, do appreciate everyone's patience. Um, that wraps up the science session. I did just post uh, an announcement for the, uh, the next Order Science webinar which I have the wrong date. It is uh, November 9th at 2 p.m. So don't mark your calendar unless you can travel back in time. But we're going to be looking at restoring fire adapted ecosystems with prescribed fire. So um, that, and thank you there. That came from one of the, the tribal NERDA workshops uh, that we had previously held. So uh, we are still working our way through topics that people are interested in hearing about. Um, so again, thank you. And I don't know, Emily or Christian, if I hand it back over to you all to give instructions for after the break.